Reports 18 present, 7 absent. Precinct 2. Precinct 2 reports 18 present, 12 absent. Precinct 3. Precinct 3 reports 21 present, 8 absent. Precinct 4. Precinct 4 reports 20 present, 9 absent. Precinct 5. Precinct 5 reports 20 present, 8 absent. Precinct 6. Precinct 6 reports 20 present, 10 absent. Precinct 7. Precinct 7 reports 25 present, 5 absent. Precinct 8. Precinct 8 reports 23 present, 7 absent. At large. At large reports 15 present, 10 absent. Precinct uh, 2 reports 19 present, 11 absent. One eighty-one. <clears throat> 181 members being present. We have the necessary quorum to uh, conduct the meeting. Uh, the monitors will please bring forward their attendance sheets. That's a piece of carbon paper there, Mr. Swazi. It's carbon, carbon paper. Yep, yep. <clears throat> the clerk will now read the warrant. Good evening, everyone. Special Town Meeting, February 10th, 2014, Milford, Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Worcester County. To either constable of the town of Milford and said county, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth aforesaid, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Milford, qualified by law to vote in town affairs, to meet in the upper hall of the Milford Town Hall, 52 Main Street, on the 10th day of February 2014 AD at 7.30 p.m., and then and there to act upon the following articles. Article 1 to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning. Motion made and second, we dispense with the reading of the articles. Does any voter care to be heard on the motion to dispense with the reading of the articles? If not, the question comes upon the motion. All those in favor, manifest by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion is carried. The clerk will now read the officer's return. Worcester County, Milford, Mass, date January 22nd, 2014. Pursuant to the within warrant, I have notified the inhabitants of the town of Milford to meet at the time and place for the purpose within mentioned by posting attested copies of the warrant in 10 or more public places in Milford. Thomas O'Laughlin, Police Chief. Thank you. I'll ask for any uh, committee reports. Mr. Johnson. Good evening. So the CIC didn't provide you a hard copy of any report tonight because these four articles don't actually meet our threshold. We figured we'd uh, pass that along. Okay, this is better. So of all the four articles tonight, the two capital ones don't meet the CIC's uh, statutory threshold. So that's why there is no CIC report amongst all your packet tonight. We're in generally in favor of the process as it's going forward with article uh, two, the school funding and with Article 3, which is to uh, take care of the historical concerns for the windows in this building, uh, but none of them actually meet our statutory, none of them actually meet our statutory uh, requirements to prov provide you all with a proper and official recommendation. That was all. Thank you. Uh, are there any other committee reports? If not, the question comes, or the, uh, what is the pleasure of the meeting? Article 1, Town Council Moody. <coughs> A 
Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, I move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw relating to public school dimensional requirements as follows. By adding in footnote F of section 2.5, the intensity of use schedule, the words, quote, public school of up to three stories, parenthesis, no more than 49 feet, end of parenthesis, end of quote, before the words, quote, or public monuments, end of quote. Motion made and second. Motion, a motion made and seconded that uh, the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw relating to public school dimensional requirements as follows by adding in footnote F of section 2.5 intensity of use schedule the words public quotation marks pub public school of up to three stories parentheses no more than 49 feet end of parentheses end of quotation before the words quotation marks or public monuments end of quotation. Um, <clears throat> does the um, finance committee have a recommendation? Refer to sponsor. Refer to sponsor. Does the uh, planning board have a report? Yes. Mr. McCarthy. Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Pursuant to the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 5, the Milford Planning Board conducted a duly posted and noticed public hearing on January 28, 2014, regarding the subject of Article 1, at which time, by a vote of four in, four in favor, none opposed, recommended to, to town meeting approval. Article 1 amends footnote F to, of Section 2.5 intensity of use schedule relating to the height requirement of schools. Uh, I should also mention for those people that are attending the town meeting for the first time, in order to address the meeting, you must be a registered voter in the town of Milford. You cannot make a motion unless you're a town meeting member, but in order to address the meeting, you need to be a registered voter in the town of Milford. In order to be recognized, uh, raise your hand, yell out Mr. Moderator, and hopefully I'll get to everybody that wants to be heard. Does any vote care to be heard? Town Council Moody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, article, it relates to the next article, the schools, but it also stands by itself. It's a zoning change that uh, when it was originally proposed um, to the selectmen and from the selectmen to the planning board was much broader because at one stage of the development of the school project, uh, the school was anticipated to perhaps have a peak roof of 70 feet in height and it was going to intrude upon a 100-foot setback uh, that's part of our zoning bylaw that's required for schools. Uh, in fact, if you're, you may be aware that at some point the building committee went to the Zoning Board of Appeals to get variances in relation to those two items, which were granted. Uh, but the building committee listened to the people, the abutters, the neighbors who spoke, uh, and they adjusted the project. Um, they adjusted it to get it out of the 100-foot setback, so they no longer need the variance in relation to the 100-foot setback at all. And they also adjusted by, for many reasons, they eliminated the peak roof, so now it's a flat roof structure. Uh, at its highest point, and they probably point out uh, at other junctures, but on some of the pictures you've seen, at two peaks it's at 47 feet, but the bulk of it is 42 feet high, uh, and a large part, portion of it is even under the 35 feet. Under our zoning bylaw, that's the limit right now, 35 feet, which was really established for uh, single family residences many, many years ago. Uh, so the proposal that you see now, the, the building committee even listened to points that were made at the planning board about public hearing about concern about the proposal being one that would leave it open-ended in terms of height. So as you heard tonight, the motion itself puts a maximum of no more than 49 feet for any school in any district. Um, so again, I think uh, it, it, this, this um, proposal really does stand by itself. There's going to be other schools in the future. Uh, these height limitation, um, lessening of the height limitations, I think could be very, very helpful. Uh, and I would urge your support in voting in favor of this article. Thank you. <clears throat> Does any other voter care to be heard? Mr. Visconti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town meeting members, my name is Mike Visconti from Precinct 8. Uh, previous speaker talked about this article 
and this zoning change standing on its own. That may be so, but we all know the reason that this article is here is to allow the Woodland School building project to proceed. What this article is attempting to, to do is a variation on what is commonly referred to as spot zoning. Now, spot zoning is an attempt to place a, the requirements of a specific zone within another zone so it will be the only area in that zone with different requirements. Spot zoning has been rejected by this town on numerous occasions and there is no reason that I can see that it should be approved tonight. I, I, I will not speak to whether, on, whether we need a new school because I am not well versed in the educational program. What I am well versed in is design, engineering, planning, and construction. So I will speak to that. The building committee should be commended because they did a lot of hard work to get this far. And they came very close to getting it right, except for two issues. They are the wrong building on the wrong site. This building has significant issues that were not addressed. Number one, well, I shouldn't say number one. Okay, uh, Mr. Visconti, I'm gonna try to restrict all the discussion. This is an amendment to the zoning bylaw which is attempting to set a height requirement within a zone for a public school. Uh, therefore, let's just talk about whether or not you're in favor of a uh, height restriction for a public school in that zone and not talk about the Woodland School project. Uh, Mr. Moderator, my comments speak directly to the merits of this article. May I continue? Well, try. I'm sorry? Try. Thank you. The placing a, a zoning change that would allow school buildings to be built in excess of the maximum height required in a residential zone uh, differs immensely from what our zoning laws were designed for. How does this look to the private developers and private industry by setting a double standard whereby the town can build schools with a lesser requirement than a de private developer could go in and build a office building or a business. This is not how we attract business and industry to our town, to broaden our tax base. This, uh, if passing this amendment, will, will, we will be taking a step backwards. Furthermore, uh, many school districts throughout the country are banning multi-story elementary schools, citing safety reasons and learning reasons. Many studies have shown that elementary students learn at a much faster rate and far more progressively when they are taught in a single level school than in a multi-level school. So if we think that we should we should pass this zoning change because it'll help our children, then we are severely misled. We cannot and should not create a double standard, even though we already have a double standard throughout the town. Case in point, the building you are sitting in now, riddled with building code violations, if it was owned by a private party, they would be fined and cited and probably ordered to fix the building code violations within a 14-day period. Double standards will not work in this town, should not work in this town, and must not work in this town. The 
the problem with the with the multi-story building and zoning change it, it allows a building to be built on a site as is proposed that does not fit on the site and does not belong there please <coughs> Do not vote in favor of this article. Thank you. Any other voter care to be heard? Um, yes, Mr. Nero first, then we'll get to. <coughs> the zoning change before us asks us to allow the school committee to do whatever they want, wherever they want, with no restriction, subject to no law, to take away- Again, Mr. Nero, I'm going to caution you. What we're talking about is whether a public school should be added to the intensity view ske schedule and should be accepted and uh, allowed to be built up to three stories. We're not talking about the Woodland uh, Project. We're talking an amendment to the zoning bylaw. It's whether or not you want to allow a structure up to three stories, not more than 49 feet. So please, like Mr. Visconti did, keep your uh, discussion to, those, uh, to that issue. I thought I was. No, you started off wrong. To take away any recourse by a homeowner, which the zoning law provides for now. No planning board approval, no zoning board approval, no zoning board of appeals approval. And most of all, no recourse to the courts if a building will destroy your property value or your neighborhood. The school committee is asking you to give them dictatorial powers. They will answer to no one. You will see in the next article exactly why these protections are necessary. The school committee was attempting to build a 70-foot high building across the street from my home in a residential zone, 70 feet high, twice the height of this building. Again, I'm going to, you know, it's going to be a long meeting, so we are, we've got to restrict ourselves. Either you're going to be out of order or get back on the track, not talking about the Woodland School. Talk about whether the building should be more the than The zoning law, feet. excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. The zoning law before us is exactly that, the height. It is asking to remove the height, and that's exactly what I'm talking about, the height. I'm using an example, but I'm talking about the height. Five times the height of the high school, the height of the St. Mary's Bell Tower across the street. In a residential zone where the limit is 35 feet. And now they want no restrictions. They are attempting to put a thousand students on the property line, again, in violation of the zoning law. No buffer zone, no restriction whatsoever. They ask, just change the zoning law for us so we don't have to do with, deal with those pesky neighbors anymore. The only recourse for us in this project was to go to court to enforce the zoning law as it stands now. They are asking you to remove it. And listen to the neighbors? They didn't listen to any neighbors. They were sued by three neighbors. That got their attention. They want you to remove that restriction so you cannot sue any longer. And the neighbors would have no protections. So they ask you to remove all zoning restrictions saying you can't give homeowners any rights of recourse. We will tell you what is good for you because we're a lot smarter than you. Mr. Moderator, I make a motion that we table this article until the body can clearly see what would happen if the school committee had this type of power and the residents had no protections whatsoever. We will see this clearly in the next article. Thank you. I take it as a motion to table the article. It's not debatable. Motion to table is not debatable. All those in favor of tabling the um, article or motion before you, uh, please manifest by saying aye. 
Those opposed, no. No. Motion to the table is defeated. Any other voter care to be heard? Town Council Moody. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just to respond to a few points that previous speakers have made. In relation to spot zoning, it's a concept I'm very familiar with, having done this for law and zoning for 35 years. And spot zoning is exactly what it sounds like. If you take a piece of land, an isolated piece of land, and you zone it differently than anything surrounding it, generally that's going to be spot zoning. But there may be exceptions to that. This isn't dealing with a certain pieces of land, piece of land. This is dealing with any school that might be in any district in town. This is the, this is the exact opposite of, town, of spot zoning. This applies town-wide to any school that might be established anywhere in town. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind in relation to schools. They are allowed in all districts in town. And the reason they're allowed in all districts in town, uh, both public and private schools, is because of something you may have heard referred to as the Dover Amendment. Uh, an amendment to the Constitution of maybe the early 60s, whereby constitutionally we have to allow schools and we have to allow public and private schools subject to only very limited reasonable restrictions. And this proposed change doesn't change anything about schools except that one aspect of height. They can be higher. It doesn't change the setbacks, as I ind indicated earlier, that is, is staying the same. It doesn't change any requirement in the zoning bylaw for planning board site plan review. There are no requirements, again, because of the Dover Amendment, beyond the dimensional requirements that are in the bylaw that are unaffected by this, the requirements for site plan review, which are unaffected by this. This only relates to height. It relates to height on any school that might be erected in the future on any district in town, so it is not spot zoning. Thank you. Any other voter care to be heard? <clears throat> A voter from precinct uh, one, is it? Constantino. Ladies and gentlemen. I spent 15 years in that school system. My time was spent mostly up at Woodland and Brookside, okay? And I know what I'm gonna tell you is true. If you went into that school years ago, you would see water trickling in, into the building, okay? That's all swamp land up in that area. P people maybe don't know that, okay? And it has a big effect on the school. This school here remind me of a casino. They could have it if they want. Again, okay. I'm going to have to get you back on track, Mr. Constable. I will talk to you about. Anyway. Okay. But we're not talking about the. To you people. We're not talking about the Woodland School in the past. We're talking about an amendment to the zoning by. Listen. Okay. Uh, Maybe my. You're talking about whether or not you want a school to be more than. 35 feet, which it presently is, and whether you want to change that to 49 feet in height. My advice to you people, don't get burnt. You will get burnt with this if you let it go through. Take my word, I know what I'm telling you. That, that land up there was all wetland. When I was young, well, I used to go blueberry up there. So I know besides working in there. And that day could hurt us along the route, just like down at Brookside. The same idea, water would come in up and through the floor. The water of the school, if you walk into the building, okay, right from the front door there, you go straight in. Over to the left would be the, uh, the day. Mr. Constantino, the right. Mr. Constantino you're, you're wandering and I'm gonna have to declare you out of order unless you get back to discussing the height of a building in the zoning bylaw. You're not gonna talk about Brookside, building. you're not gonna talk about Woodland, you're All gonna right, talk about the, the height, height of, the of the building. As far as the height of the building, a flat building is not good in New England. You can tell me yes, I'll say no. Because where is the water gonna go off the building? I used to climb the, up on that building at Woodland and clean the drains so the water would run. It still wouldn't run off. You have to have a pitch on a building to have it do right. And don't tell me any different, okay? My advice to you people is don't vote for this right now and you're looking over real good. Thank you. Any other voter care to be heard? Mr. Visconti again.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll be brief. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Visconti, Precinct 8. I, 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 I am here again to tell you that I misspoke. Did I say that? Did I misspoke? Well, I did misspeak when I referred to spot zoning. The fact of the matter is, is this zoning change, if passed, is far worse than spot zoning. It allows a specific use to be, to be built in a zone in which it is not allowed. It gives that use a free ticket to build what nobody else can build in that zone. This is unacceptable under, by any standards, under any zoning regulations in any state in the country. I know you like Milford to be first in a lot of areas, but please do not let Milford be first in this area. It would be a huge mistake. Thank you very much. Please vote no. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Any other vote to be heard? If not, the question comes upon the motion that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw relating to public school dimensional requirements as follows by adding in footnote F of section 2.5 intensity view schedule the words quotation marks public schools of up to three stories quotation uh, or parentheses no more than 49 feet end of parentheses end of quotations before the words quotation marks are public monuments end of quotation marks. Since this is an amendment to the zoning bylaw, it requires a two-thirds vote. I'll therefore take a standing vote. All those in favor of uh, the motion will manifest, uh, will rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. Is all set. All those opposed will rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. <clears throat> Precinct one. Precinct one reports nine in favor, nine opposed. Precinct two. Precinct 2 reports 17 in favor, 2 opposed. Precinct 3. I'm sorry, a little louder. 28 in favor, 1 opposed. Precinct 4. Precinct 4 reports 20 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 5. Precinct 5 reports 27 in favor, 2 opposed. Precinct 6. Precinct 6 reports 20 in favor, 0 opposed. Precinct 7. Precinct 7 reports 25 in favor, 0 opposed. Precinct 8. I'm sorry, Lewis. Uh, how many in favor? 16 in favor, 5 opposed. At large. At large reports 13 in favor, 1 opposed. One hundred seventy five having voted in the affirmative, twenty in the negative, one hundred ninety five votes having been cast, uh, the necessary two thirds has been acquired and the motion has been passed. <clears throat> Article uh, <clears throat> Article two. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator? Mr. Chaikin. I move that the town oh, vote to that's, that's okay, Mr. Chaikin. They call us. I move the town vote to appropriate the sum of fifty-nine million nine hundred thousand, and we need another zero in the parentheses, Mr. Moderator, dollars to be utilized together with any remaining funds as appropriated under Article 18 of the May 21st, 2012 annual town meeting for the construction of a new Woodland Elementary School, including payment of all costs incidental or related thereto on the site of the existing elementary school located at 10 North Fine Street. 
which school facility should have an anticipated useful life as an educational facility for the instruction of school children for at least 50 years, such sum to be expended under the direction of the school committee, school building committee, and to meet said appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the selectmen, is authorized to borrow said sum under Massachusetts General Laws Section Chapter 44 or any other enabling authority that the town acknowledges that the Massachusetts School Building Authority grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by MSBA and any other project cost that the town incurs in excess of any grant approved by and received from MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the town provided that any grant that the town may receive from MSBA for the project shall not exceed the lesser of one 59.94% of eligible approved project costs as determined by MSBA or two the total maximum grant amount de determined by MSBA and that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the town and MSBA. <clears throat> Motion made and second to the town vote to appropriate the sum of $59,900,000 to be utilized together with any remaining funds as appropriated under Article 18 of the May 21, 2010 annual town meeting for the construction of a new Woodland Elementary School including payment of all costs incidental or related thereto on the site of the existing elementary school located at 10 North Vine Street which school facility shall have an anticipated useful life as an educational facility for the instruction of, of school children of at least 50 years said sum to be expended under the direction of the school building committee and to meet said appropriation the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen is authorized to borrow said sum under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 44 or any other enabling authority that the town acknowledges that the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA and any project cost the town incurs in excess of any grant approved by and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the town. Provided further that any grant the town may receive from the MSBA for the project shall not exceed the lesser of one 59.94% of eligible approved project cost as determined by the MSBA or two, the total maximum grant amount determined by the MSBA and that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the town and the MSBA. <coughs> The vote can be heard. Mr. Mr. Moderator, Chakey. Attorney, uh, although Chakey would like to address the uh, town meeting. Mr. Chakey. Thank you, Mr. Mo Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here this evening to ask that you support the construction of a new elementary school on the existing site at Woodland. In 2012, the town meeting granted $1 million worth of feasibility study money to determine what could be done to meet the needs of the school, the school system, providing adequate facilities, and consolidating the movement of students. The Woodland Elementary School as it exists today is overcrowded. It's getting to be a problem for all concerned. The feasibility study was conducted, and we've been doing this for approximately 14 months, and it's been an extensive process. It has required a good deal of consideration, and this evening we're prepared to offer to you a proposal and seek your support for the construction of a new school facility. Now, what has driven us to this point was a program that was put together, was a long-range educational plan which was developed, and the most recent one would have been around 2004. Letters of interest were sent to the Department of Education all through this process. Our number, if you'll forgive this, finally came up a year or so, two years ago, and they authorized us to do a feasibility study to analyze 
just exactly what we would need to do to address what was in our long-range educational plan. We're fortunate this evening that the co-chairman of that study for the long-range educational plan is here, is a member of this body, and Mr. Moderator, if I may, I'd like to yield to the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Buckley, who was the co-chairman of the study committee, and ask him to just give you a brief explanation of exactly what that particular long-range educational plan has set forth for the town. Is any vote okay to be heard, Mr. Buckley? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. It was this body that um, rejected the use of the middle school east side for a plan back in, I think, 2002. Soon after that, the school committee asked some people to pull together and see if they could form a committee uh, called the Long Range Edu uh, Educational uh, Committee. And that committee was chaired by myself, who wasn't a selectman at the time, I wasn't holding office, and uh, uh, Representative Fernandes, who also wasn't holding office at that time. We co-chaired that committee. It was made up of school council members. It was made up of administrators from the school department. It was made up of FinCom members. Uh, it was made up of uh, parents in general. When we looked at what the needs were, there were two primary drivers, and that was one, that the um, current grade configuration with fifth grade in a middle school was not the direction that the community wanted to go. That committee, that committee voted very clearly that it was their belief that fifth grade belongs in elementary school and that it be afforded all the, all the opportunities that el elementary school children get in terms of recess opportunity and less transitions for each classroom. Um, the second piece of the puzzle was that they didn't think that the transitions in, in, in order to go to eighth grade and have it just be a one school island were necessary uh, in terms of the number of transitions for children within our educational system. So the two primary drivers, again, were fifth grade belongs in elementary school, and eighth grade does not need to be an island, but instead should be put in a middle school setting and what would be more traditional middle school setting. Um, that left us with what to do with middle school least. That was not the committee's charter at the time, um, but there were lots of, the, lots of discussions in terms of its potential, either educational, uh, mixed use, but again, that was not something we delivered back to the uh, to the school committee. The long range edu educational plan that you're going to hear referred to many times this evening again was developed in 2004, and as Mr. Chakey said, it isn't until now in 2014 that we've gone through the process 10 years later of getting MSBA or Massachusetts School Building um, process. Um, we've been able to get their attention, get in the queue, um, and get to this point where we are tonight. Uh, so I wanted to give you that perspective from a long-range educational plan uh, and where that was developed, and it was the school committee's charter to put that together, and I'm happy to report that that, that committee voted unanimously for the educational plan that you see today driving the current school building uh, committee and what they're trying to achieve this evening. Thank you very much. Any other vote okay to be heard? Mr. Chakey again. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, what we're going to present to you today is the whole process. And at the conclusion of our presentation, the Finance Committee will give you their analysis of the feasibility for paying for this project. What we have, what you see on the board in front of us, uh, the same handouts that you received in the mail, same thing, that shows you where we were and how we got to this particular point in time. Uh, just a very brief mention that MSBA, those are the folks in Boston 
that decide whether your project is a good project or what about your project they, they feel needs to be changed. This project has been vetted by those folks any number of times. And as recently as three weeks ago, we had already planned to meet with them end of January to get a final endorsement. Well, that was moved to March because we obviously did not have everything we needed, all, as you'll pardon the expression, all our ducks were not in a row at that <coughs> particular time. So hopefully we can line them up this evening and we'll get it back to MSBA. So what you see before you is something that started in 05, and here we are on Feb 10, assuming that we're going to vote this evening, and if we are successful and receive a positive vote this evening on March 14, uh, rather March of 2014, I think it's around the 26th or so, we will be in Boston again with all of our ducks lined up, hopefully and then we'll get our final approval from them and then the process can then begin. We're looking at a process that'll carry us into 2015 when we start to put a shovel in the ground and hopefully we're ready to go by the end of 2016 with the new building. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if I may, may we bring in our consultant to assist with the presentation uh, as to what we are doing. Uh, they are not members meeting approval. Uh, their names are Aldo oh, I gave you and uh, Matt LaRue, Matt LaRue and, Laura and Laura Wernick. Laura the uh, chairman of the uh, school building committee has requested that uh, uh, Laura Wernick and Matt LaRue be allowed to address the meeting. They are not registered voters in the town of Milford, therefore they would require unanimous consent. Does any vote uh, object to uh, hearing, uh, having them address the meeting. Hearing no objections, they're allowed to come forward and uh, assist with the presentation. As I think you've already heard, the school is the culmination of the, of the town of Milford's long-range educational plan. Uh, the school currently accommodates grades three and four. Uh, the student enrollment is 651. This will allow the, uh, a new school will be, will be able to accommodate grades three, four, and five. Uh, the existing buildings, as you've heard, have exceeded their, their uh, useful life. The building is overcrowded. Uh, the building is not handicapped accessible. Uh, it does not meet the edu educational program, the educational needs of the children who are currently in it. Uh, the feasibility study has been looking at other options for housing the, the students in grades three, four, and five. The uh, MSBA requires that uh, the consultants look at a range of options. Your school building committee required that we, as, as the architects for the project, look at any possible options that were available to the town. We actually looked at three different sites in addition to the Woodland site. We looked at the Carroll Street property, the Countryside Road property, and the Dill Dilla Street property. In addition to looking at other properties, we also looked at a range of options on the existing Woodland School site. I'm just going to talk first about the other sites that we looked at. Click it again. Uh, the Carroll Street property. Uh, the utility infrastructure is very limited there. To put in the adequate to put in adequate utilities to serve a new school would be very expensive. The site is remote from most of the residential areas in town. That means you're paying lots of costs for uh, transportation as well as parents having to drive long distances, and it's really not in a, a, an area that is considered suitable for an elementary school. Uh, so that property was considered uh, uh, really not appropriate for a new elementary school. 
The Countryside Road property, again, there's no utility infrastructure there. It's, um, in addition, uh, significant infrastructure. Uh, roads primarily would be required. All of these are additional costs to the, to the town. And again, the site is remote from most of the residential areas and the transportation costs would be high and a, and a burden on parents. Uh, the Dilla Street property, uh, as you all know, has significant traffic uh, associated with it. In addition, it's uh, my understanding and what we were told through the feasibility study process was it's really intended to be maintained into the future to the greatest extent possible as a, as a conservation area and was not considered an appropriate location for a new school. Uh, so, oh, excuse me. I'd like to just interject a moment. On all of these sites that we did here, one of the major considerations we needed to make was, what is it going to cost us to put a building on that site? Now, Carroll Street and the Countryside property, that's land between Asylum Street and Countryside, is extremely rocky. It's going to require a good deal of site development. And if any of you have been out in the world of construction, uh, even built your own home, you understand that the more digging you do, the more it's going to cost you. And when we went to the Dilla Street property, we needed to look at that. But going into it, we knew exactly what the town had appropriated funding for some years back to keep that particular property as is so we can maintain it for years to come. So 20 years from now, your children, my children, grandchildren can take a look at what that particular property looked like so that they'll have an idea of what things used to be. Now, one other point about the uh, countryside property, it's a good sized piece of property, but Laura mentioned added transportation. We also considered what is it going to cost us on an annual basis to be in that particular location. Now, I would suspect there aren't more than 25 to 50 youngsters in that area that would qualify as walkers. We would be busing probably 90 to 95 percent of our children if we were to develop some of these areas. That is an annual cost that only gets more expensive as the cost of running buses continues to increase. So that was some of the thinking process. All, as Laura mentioned, that had to go to MSBA, had to explain to them what we looked at, why we uh, didn't accept it. We looked at the site of, of the Woodland School today, and that site is going to require a minimum amount of site development uh, as we build it. So it is as cost effective as we could be, and that was one of the things that the feasibility study and the building committee with our consultants attempted to do was come up with the best plan we can for the best price we could rather than try to spend any kinds of money beyond what we needed to do. So uh, in looking at the Woodland site, the Woodland site uh, after our initial investigation became the preferable site, really the only appropriate site, cost effective site for the, for the town. Uh, but then we looked at a number of options on the site. And the first option we looked at would be, was uh, pure renovation of the existing building. Was it possible to renovate the existing building and fulfill the education, the long range educational plan for the community? The answer pretty quickly became no. Uh, the renovation would only house a, a small number, a small percentage of the students. You could not move the fifth grade in. It really could not house the uh, third and fourth uh, grades as a renovated building. Uh, there would be significant disruptions during construction. There is no place to house the students temporarily during construction, so the construction, the renovation would have to be ongoing while the students were in the school. That's a very heavy burden to put on teachers and students. Uh, it really did not solve the overcrowding, uh, the current overcrowding crowding, uh, issue, nor the desired uh, project enrollment we determined it was not a viable option. The next option we looked at was a renovation plus addition. Could we maintain the existing building? Is there a way to make use of what's there effectively, uh, cost effectively and educationally, uh, and just add on to it? And initially that was a, seemed like a very positive uh, possibility. As we explored it, it became uh, less desirable. 
to do a renovation and addition ends up being a very long, slow process. It's like three, over three years of construction. That's three years of disruption to the students. Again, there's no place for those students to go, so you have to move them around within the existing building. Uh, so it's very tough on the, on the students. In addition, because of the nature of the existing building and the way that an, a new construction would have to be added onto the site, you're creating a very inefficient building. Uh, it's really not putting the spaces that want to be next to one another, uh, close to one another. It's creating additional circulation uh, within the building. So you're building more square footage overall, or I should say, you're touching more square footage. You're building a school that will be larger in the end than if you build purely new construction. That means in the long term, it's more costly to operate. You're having to clean more, you're having to heat more, you're having to cool more. It's a more expensive, op uh, more expensive proposition in the long run. And in this particular case, because it was so inefficient, it actually was more, cost, it was more costly to construct than pure new construction. Uh, as we, d we did a, a cost estimates of this versus new construction, and a renovation and ad an addition scheme was about four to five percent more costly than new construction. Uh, and if I could just add, in addition to the uh, upfront costs being more expensive, the operational costs are more expensive because um, whenever we have the opportunity and the site allows, we like to orient the classroom wing of the building so that it's uh, oriented with classrooms either facing north or south. That saves you energy over the, all the years that the building exists. And uh, as you can see in the diagram, the drawing, uh, we're using both the part of the original building and then adding a new classroom wing, which is only could be oriented uh, in, in a direction where they're facing east or west, so it's gonna be less energy efficient over time. And one other consideration, which was a very big consideration, we spent a good deal of time talking about it, is that the last thing we wanted to do was have construction going on right next to where our children are being housed in their classrooms. One of the things we've been trying to do is, is design the site so that when construction is being done, that they're nowhere near our children. We, if we had to abut that particular building, many of us were concerned, if not all of us were concerned, that we would not necessarily uh, want to have them there because of the proximity to our children. We're talking about construction against an outside wall so it, it really didn't last too long under consideration, and we pretty much abandoned that. One, even one more additional uh, uh, issue was uh, the gym and the cafeteria would basically be out of use, would be part of the construction process for uh, over a year, so the, the children would have to have uh, lunch in their classrooms uh, and not have gym inside for well over a year. So there were a lot of reasons where this became a a less desirable uh, option. So uh, the final option we looked at on the site, and we actually looked at placing it at different places on the site, but it was an option for all new construction. This proved to be the safest uh, option, where we're separating the construction from the, from the children in school. It turned out to be the most cost-effective uh, option. It's less costly than putting an addition on the existing building. Uh, it turns out to be the most energy efficient option because we're able to orient the building appropriately on the site. Uh, this, this project, the new, uh, the new school, the layout of the new school has been vetted not only by the building committee but by educators within the building and also the, by the Mass School Building Authority, the MSBA. This is the preferred option for the site. I think you have this information in your packet. Uh, to my mind, uh, the key issue, the key lines are really the last three. The total project budget at 60,900,000. This body, as I understand, has already pro approved one million of that amount, so you're being asked to approve 59,900,000. Uh, and the town share, uh, 
the probable local, local share is uh, the 34,631,000. Being technolo uh, technologically uh, illiterate, I'm going to uh, attempt to get it back. But what we have, that the last slide that I inadvertently skipped over, well, yeah, it's, can, you fa can, you, can we afford this? You know, it's all well and good to do all of this studying. It's all well and good for us to tell you what we'd like to do. Bottom line is, at some point in time, somebody hands you the check and says, hey, we need a little money here. So it was looked at extensively by the financial folks in our town, and the conclusion was, yes, that we can. We can afford this particular uh, project, and at the conclusion of my part of the, uh, part of the presentation, the Finance Committee is going to exactly tell you what it means to you in a dollars and cents situation on an annual basis. Finance Committee is... question the superintendent just reminded me uh, why don't you just let the folks know what's likely to happen if we don't move in this direction and essentially the big thing is we lose state reimbursement for any kind of projects that we do whatever any renovations that we need to undertake will be borne solely by us us being the town of Milford and uh, we will face increases in costs as you're well aware the longer we wait to do something the more expensive it gets because nothing seems to be getting any cheaper on a daily basis. So basically we're just telling you that so that you can analyze yourself uh, exactly which way you want to go on this project. We're obviously very positively disposed to the project and we certainly hope that you will be also. Now Mr. Carrillo. been asked to come before you and talk about whether we can afford this project. Uh, many of you have been around the last decade. Many of you have asked the question, why are you building the stabilization account to where you're building it? And for 10 years we've been saying, there's a school coming. And when it got to $10 million, it's why do you need more? And we said, there's a school coming. So for over 10 years, we've built up the stabilization account now over $12 million. We've built up some capital, long-range capital accounts. Why? Because there's a school coming. And today, we're here to tell you, it's here. So the fundamental question, can we afford it? I'm going to go through some details. And the answer is yes. Why? Because you as town meeting members, for 10 years, have listened and put money away because there was a school coming. We go through. I'm not going to go through all the details because it's available to you, but at the end of the day, it's $34 million, our piece. Could it be a little less? Could be. But again, as always, we're going to be conservative. So when you look at it, question always came out, well, if it's supposed to be 58% reimbursement, it's kind of like the IRS. They tell you something, but then, oh, we forgot to say there's a limit on how much per square foot. There's a limit on this. At the end of the day, and I'll speak personally, not for the FinCom, when Aldo and Jonathan got on that committee, my comfort level went way up. Because just like it hasn't been our first rodeo of a building, this isn't their first rodeo. And if I had to trust two people to squeeze a penny into copper wire and stretch out our money as far as we could on schools, I'd pick them in the front of the bus. So as you look, all the details are there, you all have them, but more importantly, Let's deal with some facts. It's going to be worst case, 34 million. In the past, people have said, well, did you account for um, interest? Again, not our first rodeo. And if you look, yes, we have. 
okay? You've got it built in to a debt schedule that is not just the 34, but 20 years of interest on top of it. When you really look down, if this was our only project, and we really were naive and thought we'd never spend anything again, you can see the stabilization fund would only go down to nine-ish million. For those of you who can't see numbers, old people like me, we have graphs. But the graphs say the same thing. If all we spent was this school and never had anything, but remember, when we talk about capital, we got a million dollars every year built into our budget for capital. Okay, we've spent a lot of money for capital because our department heads have been smart and spent their money wisely. So we have excess cash at the end of the year. I hate calling it free cash. It isn't free. It came out of our pockets. But we have excess cash. Could it be that worst case, Department heads go brain dead. Our town meeting members forget what they've been doing for 10 years. I don't buy it. But if they did, then you could look at things like, okay, let's say we had to do $8 million worth of projects. Now, don't use the number or the projects here as guides to say, hey, Parks Department, here's a million dollars. Go figure out what to do with it, Mr. Brazo. We don't know. I'm just using it as an example. If you had a million dollar project, Godfrey Brook, for how long we've said, as long as there's hope that the state will give us money, we're not going to drop $5 million fixing Godfrey Brook. As long as it costs us less to repair it than it does to redo it, we're not going to fix it. But let's say it happened. And then let's look at $8 million worth of debt. Take a quick look. Goes down to what? Two and a half million in our stabilization. Now remember, we still are budgeting, and you'll see numbers in a minute, 1.4 million a year towards taxpayer relief. You know, question came up, what happens if a tornado comes through and blows away all of Milford? Guys, there isn't enough money to budget if we lost half a dozen buildings. But we did put away, I shouldn't say we, you put away, six million dollars towards insurance in case that happened. But here, if you look on an eight million dollar, that means we have no free cash. Look at the last nine years, you'll see that hasn't been the case. Our department heads in the town meeting have spent our money wisely. We've had free cash every year that we applied like the pond. We didn't have to go borrow millions of dollars. We had the money. But let's say it happened. And then worse comes to worse, we had another $2 million that we can't figure out what it is, but we're going to spend it. Now take a look. We're down to $2 million on our stabilization account. Now un understand, I am not saying we're going to spend this money. Okay? I am not saying we're just going to go willy-nilly putting $10 million on our stabilization. But the question legitimately has been asked, what happens if ca catastrophic events take over? We got 10 million bucks. What happens if we need to do something? Personally, I'd like to see us take a little bit like we did the last time. Take two, three years. Take a breather. We still have capital. You know, the good Dr. O'Loughlin still gets cruisers. We have capital put away so that when the Tui toys come due, you know, John squeezes his budget, but we got a ladder truck coming due for a million bucks. We put that money away. Okay. We are building in still, not a million, million four towards taxpayer relief. If we really had a problem, we don't have to put extra money away. We're putting in half a million dollars every year towards the stabilization to bring it back up. And as you see, towards the end, it goes right back up to where we want it. Now, bottom line, if the state gave us no money, no increase, zero. We would turn around, we put together a mock budget that said, okay, we know what the labor is going to go up next year. We have contracts. So if the state came through with no money and we had no excess cash, nothing, we'd have to go to the department heads and stay away from uh, Mr. Tom with his gun and tell them you got a zero increase for your expenses, not 94% of his budget which is personnel, 
we'd still have 100 grand left over. And that's basing it on us funding increases in insurance. You know, when you look at 8% increase in insurance, 6% increase in retirement, I mean, it feels safe. We'd still have 100 grand left over. And remember, there's a million bucks in there for capital. There's 1.4 million to keep our tax rates down. And then you look and say, okay, that's one year. How about the next nine years after that? Gets much better. Now, do I believe that we'd have a $900,000 surplus? Whether I believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Look at history. The fact is, we've got room. I don't believe people will go brain dead and stop doing what's made Milford strong. I believe we'll keep doing it. We'll keep counting on our town meeting members to make the right decisions. So I'm not here tonight to say good school, bad school. If you believe we should have the school and your question is can we afford it, that tells me we can. And again, thank you to Zach, to the good Dr. Abadanza and Mark Shane for going through all the details, putting it together. At the end of the day, if you're wondering if we can afford it, we can because we've been putting it away for over a decade. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Al. Al's a numbers guy, as you probably just figured out. And I prefer words. And the words I'm going to tell you is, yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are able to afford this particular building. The price is all inclusive. That means the older structure, when the new structure is available, the children will be moved into the new structure. The old structure will be, will be removed safely without anyone in the area, and then the rest of the site will be developed, including the uh, soccer field at that end of the, uh, of the facility. So ladies and gentlemen, we've tried to give you a thumbnail sketch. I realize $60 million is $60 million. And uh, we're going to ask for your support this evening because we truly believe that this is the right plan for the town of Milford at this point in time. It will allow us to accommodate our children in grades three, four, and five in an environment that is conducive to learning. It'll be a three-story structure, and we have taken cares to ensure the safety of that building so that we can protect tomorrow's future, and that's our young people. I would ask for your support when it comes time to vote on this. And thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Any other vote to be heard? Mr. Visconti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town meeting members, my name is Mike Visconti from Precinct 8. Uh, you heard from the proponents of this article. You heard from the, the architect. You heard from the Finance Committee. So you're not confused over any of the previous comments. Please keep in mind that our share, or what is being touted as our share, which is the 34 or 32 or 34 million dollars, is based on the state's approval of this project. We, as of this date, we have no approval from the state for this project. All those numbers you heard from the Finance Committee are based on a state grant of $38 million. I would ask the Finance Committee, have they done a scenario whereby the taxpayers of this town have to foot the entire $60 million bill. And how, what does that do to our stabilization count? How does that affect the numbers? I don't want to put them on the spot because they probably have not run that scenario. But off the top of my head, I'll go out on a limb here, I would say it would look pretty dismal if we had to foot the entire $60 million. And there's a better than even chance that the state will not vote to approve this project. Keep in mind, we have nothing in writing from the state approving this project. And you all know how the state works. No approval, no money, and may not get it. That means $60 million right out of your pockets, or right out of the taxpayer's pocket of this town. 
Now, if, as we hear from in campaigns of people running for office, that they will look out for the seniors and the veterans who live in our town and watch out for every dollar that is spent, we can do one of two things. We can talk about it or we can do something about it. Please. Uh, Mr. Viscotti, I don't think you have every, any, everyone's attention. Everyone should be seated, listening to the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> when, when, this project, when this project first came before this body, it was to approve, appropriate money for a feasibility study to get the project rolling. You may recall the figure of $20 million was tossed around in order to help convince you to appropriate the initial million or two, whatever, to get the feasibility study going. You were cautioned at that time, or this body was cautioned at that time, that the $20 million was an unrealistic figure. I would caution, I am here to caution you tonight that the $34 million may be just as unrealistic. We have no, I, I don't want, I hate to repeat myself, but I, it's an important point to make. We have no written approval from the state and we have no, re there is no reason to believe that that written approval may be forthcoming. Once again, I'd like to see the numbers run replacing the 34 million <coughs> or so with 60 million and see how those numbers work out. And I would like to see the bottom line with us still having a stabilization count as attractive as it looked with the 34 million dollars. I don't think you will see that. Also keep in mind that this project, the cost per square foot for this project is over 33% more than the national average for an elementary school. So wh where the savings is, where the, where the, uh, the benefit is, for building this school at such a great cost, I don't see. If other places, if other cities and municipalities in the country can do it for 33, 34, 35 percent less than the numbers shown here, why can we not do it for that kind of money? I'm sure there'll be a hundred reasons why we can't. You heard the architect and the designer talk about the, the building in general and how it needs to be built and how safe safety is a factor and so on and so forth. Well, I had the opportunity to review the plans in depth and I have some findings here of fact. Now, I will present facts. I would ask you to remove the emotional factor from your vote and rely solely on the facts, if you would. The Bible by which most architects operate called Ar Architectural Graphic Standards, and I used uh, the 11th edition, which I believe is the latest edition. I referred back to others, but the 11th edition is the one I ended up with, which I believe is the one I use now and the one I believe which is the latest edition. The the f there are some issues with, with this building on this site. Nobody has, even though you have been told that they have moved the building back from the setback line from where it was originally placed and they have lowered the height of the building, it almost appears to me, and with all due respect, it appears that they ripped a page out of the Milford Water Company playbook. That is, let's go in high and then back off a bit and everybody will think they're getting a deal and we'll run it by with no trouble at all. That's not how we should operate here. <coughs> the building itself and the access to the building, the roadways around the building, which are fire lanes, are no more than 20 feet wide and they pass through 
a recreational area where the little children that you heard we're trying to protect and make safe will be playing. Deliveries in and out of the building into the uh, cafetorium, as it's called. The only access to that delivery dock is either through the basketball courts, dodging little children and basketballs with delivery trucks, or the other route through a congested parking lot. This is not what I call a feasible design, and I believe that I, the, I would be hard pressed to, um, to be rebutted on that. The building, even though it has been moved back from the original positioning, will be slightly more than 120 feet from the center line of, of Cypress Road, where there are residential houses. This is, this is like as if it was being built next door to you. Now, you've all heard and seen when people are trying to sell their, their homes, one of the selling points they use is walking distance to schools. You've all seen it. It's a big selling point. What you've never seen as a selling point is a towering school in my backyard. You have never seen that, nor will you ever see that used as a selling point. The emergency fire access from Cyprus into the property, the turning radii will not accommodate even the smallest vehicle that the Milford Fire Department has, excepting maybe one of their small pickup trucks or the chief's vehicle. Any vehicle of any size, any firefighting vehicle of any size, will not be able to make the turn in, from Cyprus into the emergency fire lane around the building. The access from North Vine as you drive in, which is where the buses will be going, that appears to be okay, except when you get to, once again, the emergency route around the building. The radii, not adequate for fire, to fire tr uh, truck traffic. So I'm at a loss for why we would spend $60 million and end up with a school that, and, a, and a facility that is virtually no safer than the one we have there now. Once again, you were, this body was convinced that we should spend a million, couple million to begin the feasibility study a year and a half or so ago. And okay, well, that may have been a mistake, as we can see clearly now, but that's okay. We all make a mistake. We all make mistakes. But if we do not remember our mistakes, we are condemned to repeat them. Please vote no on this article. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other vote care to be heard? Uh, Mr. Correa. <clears throat> Did the Finance Committee run numbers that we would pay all $60 million? No, because the answer is we wouldn't do it. Did we run numbers that if the town got nuked, how much it would cost? No, because it's not something you deal with. The fact is we're asking for the money from the state. The state made us wait. They invited us on the list. If they came back tomorrow and said, we're not going to give you the money and it's going to cost more than $34 million, I mean, you're town meeting members. You know at the end of the year we have to transfer $8.20 by your vote. We can't spend more than 34 It isn't going to happen without coming back to you. And if it was $60 million, I would say, you got one person here that's going to say, I don't want to do it. It's too much. So. Let's deal with reality. You know, the question came up, shouldn't we be proud that we're talking about funding this school on our own? Look around. Because of the way we've budgeted money, we don't have to use those bad words. 
overrides and debt exclusions. We're doing this out of Milford money. It's our money. We're going to watch every penny of it. And if the state changes its mind, we don't go forward. They can't spend money. You know, when we say we spent at least, we gave the building committee a certain amount of money to spend. They had to stop. So I just want to put it, any questions you may have that we're going to be silly and try and double spend, first of all, we can't without coming back to you. And I'm not going to be the one standing up here saying, we thought 30 and it's 60. And secondly, they can't spend any money you don't give them. Thank you. Any other vote, <clears throat> any other vote care to be heard? Mr. Nero. I heard the sighs. <coughs> but the building committee received approval for last fall from the school committee, the planning board, the conservation committee, the zoning board of appeals, and funded by the state was a 70 foot high building a building twice the height of this town hall, a building seven times the height of the Woodland School, a building about the height of St. Mary's Bell Tower across the street, as I said before. The highest structure in Milford. You need to keep that in mind because that's what they were shooting for. 1,000 students, the largest elementary school building in the state of Massachusetts, no buffer zone across the street from my home in a residential area, all for just $60 million, the largest expenditure this town has ever made. I was deeply concerned as a homeowner about the noise and the litter, the traffic in my neighborhood, and my property values. As a town meeting member, I be, was concerned because of the cost, the need for a new school, abandoning Middle School East, demolishing the Woodland School. I wanted to understand the rationale of the building committee. So I asked them to review their records, their public records. I'd like to share with you what I learned because a lot of it is contradictory to what you've been told tonight what the media was told, what was presenting to, presented to the board, Zoning Board of Appeals for the need for a variance. Let's talk about the long-term educational plan. This is the only reason that we're here tonight. We've heard a lot of confusing rhetoric about what a long-term uh, plan is. The simplest explanation is, after reading it, the building committee, building committee files. Why they need a new school is simply because they want one. We've heard the long-term educational plan calls for a new school. Our superintendent develops his plan and outlines his vision how to best educate our children. It's his opinion how to do this. Each superintendent can give us his opinion and does so by creating a long-term educational plan. So each time you hear the words, long-term educational plan calls for, merely substitute the superintendent's opinion is, abandon middle schoolies, demolish Woodland School, and build a thousand pupil school on North Vine Street, and this will improve education. I've read the long-term educational plan. We're building a new school not because we need additional space. We're building a new school because the long-term educational plan says, our children are traumatized each time they move to a new building. We need to reduce the number of buildings in our school system. In this case, eliminate middle school East, and that will improve education. The hypothesis is each time a child changes a building, that child is traumatized. So 
To lessen this changing building trauma, we need to reduce the number of times the child moves and changes a building. With the new Woodland School, we will move grade five from Stacy, where grade five, six, and seven are presently, and now grade five will be moved to the new Woodland School. So they won't have to move to Stacy until one year later, when they go to Stacy at grade six, and this will reduce their trauma. This creates a need for 300 student spaces at Woodland School because it's at capacity. We'll cl close middle school East where eighth grade is. We'll move eighth grade to Stacy. They will now be with six, seven, and eight instead of five, six, and seven at Stacy now. This plan will reduce the transitional trauma that exists now. When grade seven moves from Stacy to middle school East 400 yards down the street to attend grade eight. But it doesn't address the trauma that they'll have when they go to high school the next year. And it's the superintendent's opinion that transitional trauma must be reduced. If we, if we want, to, uh, want education improved in our town, we have to reduce those number of buildings that we're talking about in our system so the kids don't have to move so often. This implements the superintendent's long-term educational plan of reduced transition trauma and gives us improved education for Milford's children. This is the only reason stated in the long-term educational plan for this new school we're talking about. And it only costs $60 million to reduce transitional trauma. Now, you may be a little uh, confused but the superintendent's long-term educational plan will become clearer in a few moments. I'd ask you, were you traumatized when you went from one building to another in school? I kind of remember being ex excited. I was going to the big kids' school. I left, I felt more independent, more self-assured. I was maturing. I was very young and foolish at 10 years old. And maybe I was seriously traumatized, and that's why I'm like the way I am. <laughs> I asked the superintendent, I asked the superintendent for any information, any study concerning the negative effects of grade transition. You know, the trauma he was referring to in his long-term educational plan that's going to cost us 60 million bucks to correct. That moving to another building negatively affects our children's education. And we needed to spend 60 million bucks to correct it. I was looking for some scientific support of his hypothesis. That grade configuration, that the building a child is in, and what other grades are in that building negatively affect learning. I was told by the superintendent's assessment, assistant I'm sure he has it, but he can't locate it right now. We'll get back to you. That was December 20th last year. It doesn't exist. The existence of transitional trauma, grade configuration, is the opinion of the superintendent. So follow the theory to its absurdity. The superintendent's ideal would be one building, grades one through eight, 3,000 children in one building, and there would be no transitional trauma until they went to high school. This is exactly what we did in the 1950s, eight grades in one or two buildings, or the one-room schoolhouse in which all education began in America. By the way, if you really believe grade configuration, what grades are in what buildings traumatizes little Jimmy and Susie, Consider an eight-year-old child, on his, your eight-year-old child, on his first day of school at a new building, going to the new thousand-pupil school in front of my house, to grade three with 1,000 other kids, grade three, four, and five, to the largest elementary school in Massachusetts. Now, I think that's traumatic. 
1977, I attended an opening, the opening of Woodland School. I recall standing beside Mr. John Charnessy, who was the principal at the time. We were in this enormous classroom. I asked him, why were there four teacher's desks in the center of the room? He told me it's a new teaching concept, the open classroom concept. You put four classes together, 100 students, say from grade three, in one large room, you have four teachers who teach four different subjects to classes of about 25 each, and children learn faster. I said, what the hell are you, crazy? Mr. Shaughnessy said, it's the new concept, Dan, of teaching. Open classroom. And he winked at me because he knew it was absurd. That, this was Superintendent Buckley's long-term educational plan. His opinion how to best educate our children. And surprise, chaos reigned with the open classroom and 100 little eight-year-old kids in it. Walls went up, traditional teaching was reinstituted. One desk, one teacher, one subject. The long-term educational plan failed. When Dr. Baradi became superintendent about 2000, he developed his own long-term educational plan. It dealt with infrastructure, moving grades around, what grades he felt should be in what building to best educate our children. He expressed his opinion in the long-term educational plan. When Superintendent Baradi retired about 2005, Superintendent Davron adopted Dr. Baradi's long-term educational plan with a little change. When Superintendent Tromley was appointed, he also adopted the same Baradi long-term educational plan. So when you hear long-term educational plan calls for a new school, what we are saying is Dr. Baradi in 2003 gave us his opinion that we, we should have a new thousand pupil school and we'll have smarter kids. A nine-year-old plan from two superintendents ago is guiding us tonight. There were four long-term educational plans in the building committee files that I reviewed, 2000, 2003, 2005, and Mr. Davern's uh, adjusted plan. Each one recommended different grade configurations, what grades should be in what buildings, four different opinions on how to best educate our children by putting them in the right building with the right other grades. The reality is the long-term educational plan is a moving target. It changes each time the superintendent reads about a new educational theory and changes his opinion. Only this opinion costs us $60 million, and that's what makes it real important. There are thousands of school districts across the country, and they all choose what grades and what class configurations will be in each building. K through five, K through three, one, two, three, one through six, one through eight. There is no consensus of any best way which grade configuration results in the best education. There is no empirical evidence that grade configuration has anything to do with academic achievement. And you know, I bet the kids don't care a bit. The question is, do you care $60 million worth? But this is not just a $60 million decision. There are real costs associated with abandoning middle school East. A perfectly functional 500 capacity school the cost of demolishing Woodland School, a functional 600 pupil school, built in 1976 for $26 million, your $26 million. So hypothetically, let's just guess. Middle School East is worth, say, five or 10 million bucks as a saleable asset. Woodland School is worth probably 20 million bucks. We're just guessing. And the architect says it'll cost $4 million to demolish it and haul it away. You are four million bucks. And there's a 9.5 million in interest on the new school. So our decision tonight is not 60 million, it's closer to 100 million, because we bought both of those schools. Dr. Baradi's plan in 2003 didn't call for the demolition of Woodland School, but renovating it at minimal cost. 
and using it for kindergarten and administrative offices for the entire school system. His plan called for a thousand pupil school on 20 acres of town-owned land at the intersection of 140 and countryside, as they explained to you, a short distance from the geriatric building. He emphasized this was the best and only location for the new thousand pupil school in 2003 and 2005, the same building that we're talking about tonight. All the infrastructure was in place and he had engineering statements to establish it at Countryside Lane that would handle a thousand pupil school. Roads, water, sewer, electrical were all in place and there were, there were no zoning issues because it was a commercial area. The school committee came to us with that plan in 2003 for the $60 million school then, and you turned it down in your wisdom. Dr. Barati offered an alternative if we did not want to build a new school. He suggested adding a 20,000 foot square foot addition to Woodland School. This would accommodate 300 grade five students. He wanted to move to Woodland School. This is the same current idea before us tonight. And there are still 300 grade five students many years later. Woodland School is 67,000 square feet. Dr. Barati's addition was 20,000, that's 87,000 for 300 <coughs> students. The new school building is 132,000 square feet, twice the size of Woodland School, and 45,000 square feet larger than what Dr. Barati felt was necessary for 30, 300 students. I asked the building committee for any study which led to their decision to close middle school east. There is none. Maybe you recall Mr. Donesco, it's an architect that we hired in 2003. It's an engineering firm. He evaluated all our school buildings. One of his conclusions was, Middle School East was the best constructed building in our school system and required the least amount of renovations. The school committee wants to abandon Middle School East with no plan for its use or sale, just like they abandoned the elementary school for 25 years until it was worthless. Superintendent Barati's long-term educational plan didn't call for closing Middle School East. In 2003, he suggested as an alternative to a new school, a 29 classroom addition to Middle School East, which was the best school in the system. Additions to Brookside and Woodland School, all for just $66 million. The building committee file reflects all types of enrollment figures. Enrollment has been stable for the Milford school system for 10 years plus or minus 4,000. From 2002 to 2013, 11 years, enrollment has increased by 36 students for the entire system in 11 years. The capacity of the Milford school system is 4,905. The 2013 enrollment is 4,193. If you're trying to make the calculation, we currently have 712 empty seats in the system. The state projection for enrollment was in the building committee file. Enrollment will drop to 3,800 in the next five years. They've done the demographics, freeing up an additional 400 seats. That's 1,100 empty seats. 700 empty seats equals 28 vacant classrooms. Woodland School has 630, 650, with 630 in the records I read. 700 empty seats in the system equates to a Woodland School. 1,100 empty seats exceeds the capacity of the new school. So we can see the enrollment increases are not the reason for a new school. As we've been told, we're abandoning middle school lease and lose 500 spaces. Current enrollment is 321, 179 empty seats in middle school East. Demolishing Woodland School, we lose 600 spaces. 
The school committee logic is, therefore, we need a new school. The need for a new school is entirely self-created by the school committee and the long-term educational plan of the superintendent. So what we've learned about long-term educational plans, they're not very long-term at all. It changes each time the superintendent changes his opinion. We had four long-term educational plans in five years, and our current plan hasn't been updated in nine years. Our plan, long-term educational plan, deals solely with infrastructure, not improving test scores. What buildings we have, what buildings we should have, what grades should be in each of those buildings, and the results of all of this, the right buildings, and we'll get much smarter children. Our long-term educational plan has little to do with education, raising our MCAS scores. We have the lowest MCAS scores and SAT scores in the region. We are in the bottom one-third of the state with Brockton, Boston, and Lynn. We have the lowest graduation rate and the lowest rate of students attending college. We have the highest dropout rate in the area. Do you believe building a $60 million school will improve any of that? In my opinion, test scores improve and kids get to go to the most prestigious colleges and thus get the best jobs, not by building a new $60 million Woodland School, but by hiring the best staff and the best leaders to lead them and developing a program for hotel management to get minimum wage jobs, in my opinion, doesn't open any doors or improve any test scores. Let's talk about the uh, composition of the building committee. The committee that recommended a building twice the size of the one they put before you tonight, just a few weeks ago, until me and two other neighbors sued them to have them comply with the zoning laws. The building committee has 15 members. The superintendent and the school committee designed it. The superintendent is a member. Three members work for the superintendent. Three members are former school employees. One school committee member, two, one former school committee member, two children of school committee members, and three town officials. I read through the building committee minutes. All unima unanimous votes, 15 members agreed all the time to do what the superintendent wanted. Not one objective voice on the building committee for the taxpayer. The organiza organizational minutes of the building committee on 8-22-12 reflect something very comical happened. One very foolish member on the, at the first meeting said, it's recorded in the minutes, why do we need to move grade five to Woodland School? Why do we need a new building? What a foolish question. How naive, Obvious, obviously this guy had never heard of the ravages of transitional trauma. The chairman told him in no uncertain terms, recorded in the minutes, we will not be developing a new philosophy, but we will follow the long-term educational plan. Let me translate that double speak for you. We're here to do what the superintendent wants. We're not here to do what, the, what is best for the community, the taxpayers, or even the children. We're here to build a new school, because that's exactly what the long-term educational plan says. Now sit down and get in line like the rest of us. Let's talk about the condition of the Woodland School. I live across the street from the Woodland School. Hey, uh, will the gentleman, will the gentleman in precinct seven be seated and stop speaking out unless you want to be removed from the hall i live across the street from the woodland school 
I watched it being built in 1976 and 77, and my wife was on the Woodland School Building Committee and the Brookside School Building Committee. I walked the school, school grounds regularly, and my children attended the school, and I attended many events at the school. Each day, I watched several hundred students trying to cross the street in front of cars, buses, and trucks, eight and nine-year-old kids dodging the traffic, getting into their parents' cars and trying to cross the street, and, can't, and emergency vehicles that can't get by. Over 37 years of being across the street, I watched the Woodland School deteriorate. No landscaping, no grounds cleanup, drains never cleaned, water creating a swimming pool in the play area, water backing up on the roads, the walkways, and into the school, retaining ponds full of plants and debris, and the same on the inside, a simple philosophy of neglect. On 11-14-13, I attended the ZBA meeting as an abutter to the new school with many of my neighbors. The building committee asked for a variance to build a 70-foot building three stories high in my residential neighborhood. <coughs> and in the front yard of the people on Cypress Street, the school would have 1,000 students playing on the Cypress Street property line with no buffer zone. This is a video of the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting taken by the cable company. I heard the building committee tell the ZBA it would cost more to repair Woodland School than to build a new school. I heard them say all major systems had to be ripped out and replaced. They could not be repaired. Plumbing, electrical, heating and air conditioning, the windows were cloudy, did not function, leaked, and all needed to be ripped out and could not be repaired. In 1977, excuse me, in 1997, the state did an engineering study of all our schools. Their comment on Woodland School, overall the Woodland School is in sound condition. There were two engineering uh, studies in the, in the uh, building committee files on Woodland School, the 2003 Dinesco report and the 2013 Architects report from a consultant they hired. The Dinesco report highlights no maintenance, no modernization performed at any of our school buildings. All buildings need updating. Woodland School needs renovation and could be rehabbed by spending a small amount of money on each system in the building. Dinesco commented, Middle School East was the best constructed building in the system, requiring the least repairs. The selectmen in about 2004, not the school committee, the selectmen asked us to follow the Dinesco recommendations as a town meeting to upgrade all our school buildings. In 2004, we spent 1.2 million on a new roof at Woodland School. 2005 and 6, we upgraded the floors at Woodland School. 2006, we, insulated, uh, we installed a new boiler. 2004 through 2008, we refurb refurbished the inside of Woodland School. We upgraded all systems for $3 million. HVAC, plumbing, electrical doors, windows. You paid millions to upgrade Woodland School recently. Both the 2003 Dinesco report and the 2013 engineer's report evaluated each system separately, in detail. They're both in the building committee files. The most recent one, electric and heating, need updating, roof, good condition, plumbing needs maintenance but is fine, code does not require any updating. Floors and ceilings, fair condition, foundations adequate. Exterior walls, minor cracks in non-load bearing walls. Interior walls, satisfactory, minor cracks. Class classrooms need painting. Building committee said the windows were cloudy, non-functional leaking. Two engineering reports state some original windows, two eighth, uh, five eighths inch insulated glass. There's no negative comments in either report about the windows. Yesterday I walked around the school. I didn't see one cloudy window. 
The conclusion in the 2013 report done by the same architect that made her presentation this evening, the quote, no substantial structural issues have been observed at Woodland School. In 2013, last year, the architect provided several options to the building committee. And remember, the architect works for the building committee and not you. The architect is paid by the building committee and the architect does what the building committee wants. Option one, rip out all systems, don't repair them. As their own report suggested, no repairs. Though their report suggested they could be repaired. The building committee asked the architect to price out ripping all systems out, all plumbing pipes, all electrical wires, everything. The entire heating system, remove all the windows, leave only four walls standing, install all new systems. The cost, $29 million, was rejected by the building committee. They want a new school. Option two, gut Woodland School. Rip out all those systems I just mentioned. Add 15 classroom addition to accommodate 300 grade five students. Keep the 15 classroom figure in mind. When we get to the new schools, new school with 105 classrooms in the new school. 63.6 million rejected by the building committee because it's 2.3 million higher than the new school, we want a new school. Option three states, if the superintendent insisted on moving 300 new students to Woodland School, this would cause severe overcrowding. A new building would be required. And this is the option the building committee chose. A new, magnificent, massive, luxurious, three-story, 70-foot high with 20-foot ceilings, like this ceiling right here, 20-foot ceilings with seven-foot windows, those are eight-foot windows, like these, and plenty of extra space to add to the 1,100 empty seats in the system. There was no option for, no option for, rehab Woodland School, not got it, update and repair all systems, as the consultant's report suggested build 15 classroom addition as called for in the plan, the long-term educational plan, to accommodate the 300 grade five students, 42 million, the architect said. The building committee ignored this. They could have saved us $18 million. They wanted a new school. You can construct an addition with the students in the old building, move the kids to the new addition, and the 700 to 1,100 empty spaces in the rest of the system for one year while we rehab the building. The building committee said this is not acceptable, and they gave as one of their reasons, as they mentioned tonight, the kids would have to eat their lunch at their desks for a year. It was not acceptable to us, is what the report says. We want a new school. There was no option five, simply rehab Woodland School, don't rip out all the systems which merely need upgrading, and don't move the 300 new students to Woodland School. Manage them within the 700 empty seats. Cost about $10 million. Woodland School was designed for K through five, 800 students, not 500 as we've been told. My wife again was on the building committee. The school was designed so kids could walk to school from the neighborhood to reduce transportation costs. About 1990, the long-term educational plan changed. K through five was shifted. Grades three and four were left at Woodland School. And four temporary classrooms were added to increase the capacity by 100. So theoretically, Woodland School was built for 800 students with four temporary classrooms adding 100 more seats Total capacity of Woodland School, 900 students. Current enrollment, 630, 270 empty seats. Now some would say, I've been to Woodland School. It's, I, just, I saw the superintendent's video in our last meeting. Woodland School looks crowded. Well, I'd like you to consider that maybe it is crowded, but because the place is a mess, poorly ma uh, maintained, poorly organized, 
and the space is mismanaged, just like the 700 students' uh, empty seats are mismanaged. And keep in mind, Brookside was built two years after Woodland School, 1979. Brookside was built by the same architect as Woodland School. So similar plans were used, and Woodland and Brookside look alike. Brookside also had open classroom design, the same as Woodland School, to conform to Superintendent Buckley's long-term educational plan. We rehabbed Brookside. An addition was added in 2005. Eight new classrooms, increasing the capacity by 200 students to a new capacity of 760. Enrollment is 551, 209 empty seats. The building committee says, Woodland School cannot be rehabbed like Brookside. It must be demolished. Why? Because we want a new school. Let's talk about the new school. The funding article before us is not specific as to a 70-foot school or a 40-foot school. So come tomorrow morning, if you pass this article, they can build any school they want. The building committee is asking for the $60 million to be spent at their discretion to build a new school, a 70-foot school or a 40-foot school. They will decide if you give them a yes vote. The request a month ago was $60 million for a 70-foot building. They tell us they cut the height of the building nearly in half, but the request is still for $60 million. $60 million for a 70-foot school and $60 million for a 40-foot school. Does that make sense to you? The 70-foot building was approved by the school committee, the planning board, the conservation commission, the ZBA, and funded by the state. The 40-foot school has had none of those approvals. You need to ask yourself, what building is going to be built tomorrow morning if I give them this money? And if your first impression of the building is you like it or you don't like it, keep in mind it was twice as big just a couple of weeks ago. The Covent Woodland School has 39 classrooms, 630 students. The new school has 105 classrooms, 61 standard classrooms, 44 small group classrooms for 1,000 students, almost two and one half times the classrooms at Woodland School. The largest elementary school in the state, fully air conditioned. And remember the 2005 variety plan called for 15 new classrooms? At Woodland School, a $20,000 square foot addition. The new school has 90,600 90, square feet of classroom space, double the space at Woodland School. The student size at Woodland School is increasing by 30% at the new school, 300 students. The new building is increasing by 100%. The state points out in their correspondence to us, the new school, I quote, exceeds the space re recommended by the state by thousands of square feet. The 70-foot building had a flat roof. I read the specs submitted to the state. In September, the building committee specifically requested funding for a flat roof on their 70-foot school. The 40-foot building will have a flat roof. There never was a plan for a pitched roof, though we've been told there was. <coughs> the new building has 160 skylights. Some extend from the floor to the roof, 40 feet of unused space. 240,000 cubic feet of unused space to be heated and, and cooled. I should not have said unused space. Some of it will be used, excuse me. The size of a large house lot. The Woodland School has 92 windows. The new school, as I count them, has 425 windows. Obviously, 49 is not enough for eight-year-olds to stare outside and get distracted. But the new 425 floor-to-ceiling windows will. And what comes in to 485, uh, excuse me, 585? windows and skylights, lots of solar energy, like your car on a hot day in the parking lot. 
So if you have any HVAC experts, air conditioning and heating, in the audience, what would, guess, what would you guess the heat loss in a 585 windowed school is in February at 10 degrees? The 70 foot building at, at uh, uh, excuse me, the 70 foot building the building committee wanted would be the highest structure in Milford. Two and a half times the height of Stacy, seven times the height of the current Woodland School, about the height of St. Mary's Bell Tower across the street. The 40 foot building will be about the height of the clock tower on this building. This is bureaucracy gone mad with your money. The building committee told the ZBA the Woodland, Woodland was the only location approved by the architect. That is incorrect. The town owned land on countryside was also identified as a potential site. The big building committee told the BZ ZBA that they met with them numerous, they met with the Conservation Commission numerous times to build a flat building, a one story building on Woodland site or to place the three-story building away from the, the uh, boundaries so that there would be buffer zones for the neighbors. The big building committee told the ZBA it was all wetlands and the Conservation Commission would not allow them to build on the wetlands. They met with the uh, Conservation Commission three times, 516, 620, and 718. 516, 620, the building committee presented nothing. They asked for a postponement. On 718, they presented the final plans to build a three-story, 70-foot high building on the soccer field. The building committee never asked for a waiver to build on the wetlands. By the way, they aren't the kind of wetlands that are wet. They don't have any water on them. They're called vegetated, vegetated wetlands. They're the type that have plants on them. You ask the Conservation Commission for a waiver and you can move that building any place you want on that site. And remember, the current Woodland School was built on a swamp by simply, simply filling in approximately 10 acres to construct the school, the parking lots, the fields, and the play areas. And you know when you built Woodland School, those parking lots and play areas in these wetlands, you know what they found? Not gold. No, they found five foot, 20 foot in circumference boulders, about a hundred of them. They called it glacial till. And you know where they dumped them? Right where you're going to build that building in that soccer field. I lived there. I saw it. The contractor asked for a half a million dollars to move those boulders, and he sued the town of Milford. They're all under that soccer field, and you're going to pay to move them again. The current Woodland School staff is 93. The planned new staff is 150, 60% increase in staff with a 30% increase in students. Do you know we won a prize last year? We were recognized by the State Educational Authority as having the most school employees per pupil in the state. The new building is built on, right on the property line of Cypress Street in a residential neighborhood with very small buffer zone. 1,000 screaming children yelling Nine, eight, nine, and ten-year-olds playing on the property line of these people. Litter and debris, snow plows running all night on the winter nights. The current Woodland School has 20, 94 parking spaces. The new school has 244, a 255 percent increase. And added, added to the funding, two new fields with artificial turf for elementary school children cost $1 million. Communities across the state are seeking to reduce energy consumption. This building has an atrium with 160 skylights, some running from the first floor to the roof, 240,000 cubic feet. 
The 70-foot building had seven-foot windows, as I said, 20-foot ceilings, and exceeded the state guidelines for space per pupil. The 70-foot building received zero reimbursement for green schools because of this extravagance. What do you think the 40-foot building will receive? The state notes in their correspondence that the school commission, committee wishes to demolish the Woodland School, a functional 600-student building, close Middle School East, a functional 500-student building, to simply reconfigure grades, the town of Milford must reimburse the state for renovations that the state paid for Woodland and Middle School East. We must pay $1 million back to the state. You pay it out of your real estate taxes. It's not reimbursable. The building committee decided not to use the state recommended school building plans offered at no cost that would save us $1 million. Between no green schools, not using state standardized plans, reimbursing the state for a million dollars, four million to demolish Woodland School, one million for artificial turf fields, we'll get base reimbursement, the lowest possible reimbursement that a town can possibly get. And we could have received a 60% reimbursement a loss of about $11 million plus another million dollars in interest on that $11 million. You've heard the building committee say that we're complying with state mandates. You read that correspondence, there are very few state mandates except for safety. Do you think a three-story, 40-foot, 70-foot high building is a safe design for elementary school children? We went from multi-story buildings in the 1940s to single-story buildings in the 1970s. Buildings with multiple on-ground exits for the safety of the children. Easy to evacuate designs, especially for grade school kids. No steps for children to fall down. Now I want you to picture the thousand kids, eight, nine, and 10-year-olds each day of school outside the building and the bell rings. Little 10-year-old kids, Johnny and Susie, must climb 50 steps to get to their third floor class, or 100 steps in their 70-foot building. At the end of the day, the same bell rings. 1,000 kids are trying to get out of that building, 600 of them on the second and third floor. So what do you think the daily potential for an accident is of one of those kids falling down those 50 steps? And let's take the worst case scenario in a three-story, 40-foot building of a fire or a boiler explosion on the first floor or even the horror of a gunman on the first floor. And there's no fire escapes in modern buildings. You use the stairwells. And like the stairwells were blocked and full of flame in a 9-11 tragedy, stairwells are not reliable. So consider that it's a life-threatening emergency You've got to evacuate hundreds of kids from the second and third floor, one at a time, over fire truck ladders. And 160 skylights that are going to act like a chimney to fuel any fire to, to grow furiously fast. I don't think it's a safe design. I think they're trying to get rid of me. We're almost done. I know that's what the applause was for. The Woodland School is required for one reason. The superintendent wants to move fifth grade to 300 students. The children will be traumatized if we don't do that. They decided to go with let, not go with less costly ways of meeting the superintendent's request. They decided to present just one option to us, $60 million or nothing. They didn't try to run by us any of the less costly ways of remedying any problems at Woodland School. A 
couple of final comments, and I'll get the hell down. This is a classic, sto this classic storybook tale of the king with no clothes. A building committee entirely composed of people from the school system. A, a superintendent who controls their jobs and 600 other jobs and $40 million in discretionary funds. Afraid to tell the boss, this is a crazy idea. Ladies and gentlemen, this really comes down to a couple of just very simple questions. Would you put your eight-year-old kid in a thousand-pupil school, the largest in the state, or would you want him in a small neighborhood school? Will any of this, building a new school, improve any of the test scores that we have? There will be those that will try to argue against these facts and that they will try to obfuscate these facts. Those that will deny these facts or even ignore them. But the sad and most serious fact is these facts are in the building committee files. And the facts they all knew or should have known. And I think you need to ask why you weren't told all of this. The last few days I've heard on the radio pull out the usual trump card, the billing committee pull out the usual trump card when bureaucrats want our money. It's for the children. You don't want to hurt the children. Think of the children. Give us the 60 million bucks. Do you believe any of this is for the children? with failing test scores, the worst graduation rate, the lowest number of children going to college. There's a word for people to use kids to get your money and achieve their personal goals, but it's too harsh to use. All they want is a new school at any cost. I'm not against the best education for our children. I'm not against a complete renovation of the Woodland School. I'm not even against a new school, if reasonably constructed. I am against what occurred here tonight. Thank you for listening. A lot of boring facts about the Woodland School, and thank you for your patience. I tried to keep the sarcasm to a minimum, and I even tried to be funny a couple of times. I hope you got the picture. Thank you. Any other vote can be heard? <clears throat> Mr. Sabino. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sal Sabino. If you don't recognize me, the hair is gone. <laughs> I'm in precinct five and I'm about to deny what you just heard. And I'm gonna tell you why. This is my last town meeting, by the way, because I'm moving. I thought I'd tell you that, so when we leave after you hear what I have to say, they won't say he doesn't care. I care, I've lived in this town all my life. I have grandchildren in this town. I, had, I have a grandson in Texas A&M. I have one at Wentworth. I don't know how the hell he graduated in such a bad town with such a bad school system. I really don't. <laughs> I sound upset, I want you to know that I am. Why am I upset? Because I'm a member of the school committee of this town for six years, your state representative for two. I have been on the sewer commission. I ran 31 stores for Stop and Shop and I'm about to tell you how all these negative things get done the right way. The first speaker that was negative, and I'm sick of hearing all this negative stuff about our town, but let me just say this to you, okay? The first speaker said to you, he wasn't gonna speak that long, because he didn't have the particulars, and then told you that he knows that little cars can't make the turn. Well, if you don't know anything about it, I wouldn't make a statement like that, okay? Secondly, you heard the previous speaker say to you that he lives across the street from that school, and you heard him say that it has deteriorated, and now he's telling you it doesn't have to have a new school. I have a problem with that. I was getting a little confused. 
I don't know how I, I don't know how I graduated from this school. Listen to me closely, ladies and gentlemen. It's the last time I'm going to be able to get this off my chest. I lived on Beach Street next to the Acheraba, which you know about the pollution that went on. I lived next to Milford Shoe, the highway department, the Charles River behind my yard with no fence, carnivals in that big space where they carried the stuff. And I had a hell of a life. Everybody loved everybody. We got along. We were careful. And I didn't get any trauma when I went from the Claflin Street School. I didn't get any trauma when I went into the Park Street School. I thought it was an up, a, what, do you, what do we call it then? I'm 80 years old, so I can forget a little bit, all right? I, I went in and I thought I was an upperclassman, maybe an elementary upperclassman, but I was in another school. And then I went, God forbid, to the Stacy School. And in my three or four years there, I never fell down the stairs and I don't know anybody else that did. <laughs> okay? We have teachers that are taking care of these people. Let me give you, this is a no-brainer, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to me closely because I'm never going to get a chance to say this again. In the years that I've been here, and I've served you for 41 as a town meeting member and another 15 or 20 in other places, this committee that you see here, this board of selectmen that you see there, we have the lowest tax bill around. We did all this stuff that he told you that we blew money on unnecessarily. A million dollars for this and $20 million for that. We did that, ladies and gentlemen, without an override and haven't had one and don't look like we need. We have $13 million in the stabilization fund. That's not stupid. That's good planning. We have a record of people who work for us that have done a hell of a job giving us a new field for the football. And I'm not going to sit here and let people degrade the people who gave of their time here. And I'm pretty happy with the town I lived in. I am leaving simply because I'm old and I can't handle my swimming pool and my house. Okay? And I forget a lot. So I need to have my daughter, who's in Hopedale, to tell me, there's the bedroom, there's this, there's that. But I tell you, I hate leaving Milford, but because I'm 81. Do me a favor, ladies and gentlemen. I've served you for 41 years. Give them that school for our kids, okay? Because education isn't 29 windows, okay? We didn't have air conditioning. We got all of this stuff. I can tell you, I didn't, grad, I didn't uh, make it to college because we didn't have the money. But common sense was taught to me by all these people that are sitting here. A lot of them I've known for all my life. Do the right thing, build a school. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other vote care to be heard? Mr. D'Antonio. Mr. D'Antonio. Motion has been made to move the previous question, which is an attempt to shut off debate. It's uh, a not a debatable motion, requires a two-thirds vote. Uh, <clears throat> all those in favor of moving the question will rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. All those opposed to moving the previous question will rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. <clears throat> Precinct 1. Precinct 1 reports 9 in favor, 8 opposed. Precinct 2. Eight. Precinct 2 reports 18 in favor, 1 opposed. Precinct 3. Precinct 3 reports 17 in favor, 5 opposed. Precinct 4. Precinct 4 reports 17 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 5. Precinct 5 reports 28 in favor, 1 opposed. Precinct 6. Precinct 6 reports 19 in favor, 1 opposed. Precinct 7. Precinct 7 reports 24 in favor, 1 opposed. Precinct 8. 
Precinct 8 reports 19 in favor, 3 opposed. At large, at large reports 14 in favor, none opposed. Sixty-five to twenty. Uh, One hundred sixty-five having voted in favor, twenty opposed. The necessary two-thirds has been acquired to move the previous question. The question now comes upon the motion <clears throat> that the town <clears throat> vote to appropriate the sum of fifty-nine million nine hundred thousand dollars to be utilized together with any remaining funds as appropriated under Article 18 of the May 21, 2012 Annual Town Meeting for the construction of a new Woodland Elementary School, including payment of all costs incidental or related thereto on the site of the existing elementary school located at 10 North Vine Street, which school facility shall have an anticipated useful life as an educational facility for the instruction of school children of at least 50 years, said some to be expended under the direction of the school building committee and to meet said appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen is authorized to borrow said sum under Mass General Laws Chapter 44 or any other enabling authority. That the town acknowledges that the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA and any project cost the town incurs in excess of any grant approved by and, re and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the town. Provided further that any grant that the town may receive from the MSBA for the project shall not exceed the lesser of one 59.94% of eligible approved project cost as determined by the MSBA or two, the total maximum grant amount determined by the MSBA and that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement they may, that may be executed between the town and the MSBA. Since the motion as presented requires uh, borrowing and requires a two-thirds vote, all those in favor of the motion will rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. All those opposed will rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. <clears throat> Precinct 1. 11 in favor, 5 opposed. Precinct 1 reports 11 in favor, 5 opposed. Precinct 2. Precinct 2 reports 18 in favor, 1 opposed. Precinct 3. Precinct 3 reports 18 in favor, 4 opposed. Precinct 4. Precinct 4 reports 17 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 5. Precinct 5 reports 27 in favor, 2 opposed. Precinct 6. No. We'll count abstentions. 19 in favor. 19 in favor. If he doesn't vote, we don't count it. None opposed. <clears throat> Precinct 7. Precinct 7 reports 24 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 8. Precinct 8 reports 18 in favor, 3 opposed at large. At large, 14 in favor, none opposed. Uh, 166 having voted in the affirmative, 15 in the negative. The necessary two thirds has been acquired and the motion is carried. <laughs> Article 3. Uh, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, I move that the town vote to amend its vote under Article 17 of the October 22, 2012 special town meeting 
relating to windows at the Milford Town Hall to allow for renovation and or refurbishment of existing windows as part of the project. Motion made and second the town vote to amend its vote under Article 17 of the October 22, 2012 special town meeting relating to windows at the Milford Town Hall to allow the, for renovation and or refurbishment of existing windows as part of the project. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? What are we? Favorable. Favorable. Uh, town Council Moody. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the vote that's referred to in there was an appropriation of a, a while ago, uh, which you uh, authorized the replacement of the windows of the town hall. Uh, and since looking at the project, it's been determined that from a historical perspective, it's going to be better to refurbish the windows. Uh, and in fact, that's actually going to be a cheaper methodology. But in order to do that under that vote, we need to include those words, uh, renovation refurbishment, and that's all we're asking you to do. So there's no further financial effect. Any other vote that can be heard? If not, the question comes upon the motion as presented. All those in favor will manifest by saying aye. aye. <coughs> those opposed, no. Motion is carried. <coughs> Article 4. Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, I move that the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to execute a boundary line agreement between the town of Milford and Canyons LLC and Huntoon LLC in order to fix a common boundary line between land owned by the town situated on Granite Street being shown on assessors, uh, Milford Assessor's map is parcels 410436 and land owned by Huntoon LLC and Canyons LLC. Situated on Main Street being shown on the Milford Assessor's map as parcels 410438, parcel 410439, parcel 410440, parcel 410441 and further shown on a plan, um, plan of land in Milford Mass, owners lot 46, inhabitants of the town of Milford, lot 48, Huntoon LLC, lot 439, 440, and 441, Canyons LLC, scaled 20, inches, 20 feet to an inch, dated January 10th, 2014, prepared by Guerrier and Howland Inc., engineers and land surveyors, 333 West Street, Milford, Massachusetts. Motion made second that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to ex execute the uh, boundary line agreement as set forth in the motion. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? Refer to sponsor. Refer to sponsor. Does any vote care to be heard? Town Council Moody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the property that we're talking about here is the uh, former Marcones Market down here on East Main Street uh, and the residential buildings that were once there. And of course, as you all know, it's since been raised, it's cleared, it's getting ready for development. Um, that property um, had been in the situation it was, backed up to the town property for many, many, many years. Uh, and the deed references and the records in the Registry of Deeds were not good. Uh, in terms of the title examination, the developers and owners found that the back line between the town property and the former Marcon area properties uh, were not well defined. Um, and even though there, there had been a fence there and everybody knew exactly what we were dealing with in terms of the town property, in terms of the private property, again, the, it was never laid out in a fashion suitable for recording in the Registry of Deeds. So plans were prepared, uh, the uh, developers met with the selectmen, everybody agrees that the line that's being set uh, by the vote here tonight and then the selection's action is in fact the line that people have been dealing with for the last 50 plus years where there was a fence behind the property in any event. So this will simply allow that line to be, to be drawn so in the future it'll be clear as to whose property is whose. Thank you. <clears throat> Does any other voter care to be heard? Yes, the voter in, uh, come forward. Are you a registered voter in the town of Milford? All right, uh, the gentleman is a registered voter in the town of Milford and uh, is requesting permission to address the meeting. Does anyone object to him addressing the meeting? Hearing no objection, please come forward and uh, state your uh, concern. Please identify yourself, name and address. My name is Jamie Wheelock. I live on uh, Cunniff Ave. I'm wondering if this has to be done and is it more in favor of the developer to get what they need done or is it gonna solve a tremendous problem for the town? Are both parties coming to this with equal interest or is the town going to solve a problem that it needs solved more badly than the developer needs solving? And if the situation is less than equitable, should the town ask for anything more than just to establish the lines as they currently appear to be, even though those are not the actual lines? Should the town ask for anything besides 
admitting that the lines that are now in place are not the actual boundaries, but we'll settle for those. Okay, We've, uh, right, does any vote care to be heard? Town Council Moody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, as I expressed before, the uh, fence that's behind the property has been there for many, many years. That has been what all parties have treated as the property line. That's what we're going to treat as the property line. Neither party is getting any advantage out of this, except that both parties are now, for now in the future, going to know precisely from a recorded standpoint what the property lines, which they've always expected to be, that that's where they are. That's, that's all there is to it. Any other voter care to be heard? It, yes, once again. Please come forward. Your very thoughtful answer, um, I'm not sure it answered whether the situation couldn't just be let the developer buy what they've bought, let them pay for what they've bought, what they want to buy. Do we have to do this is what I'm saying. All right. I don't, I don't think Raise your the answer. question. I think the, the question has been answered as far as I think town council indicated that the uh, parties have agreed upon a particular boundary line, though it's not clear from the records at the Registry of Deeds and the, the descriptions of various lots, apparently, if I can uh, uh, enter my particular opinion as to what, what they're trying to do is just resolving and saying apparently the fence is what the boundary's been, and now we're, we're establishing that. No one's gaining, from what Mr. Uh, Moody said, no one's gaining an advantage. All right. Uh, How bad is it if it stays where it is then? All right, it's, it's a, a question, I, I, I don't know. I'm not gonna say anything else. All right, you raised the question, anybody else can clarify it or any other voter care to be heard? Okay, uh, the question comes upon the motion as presented. Since it's uh, an interest in land, it does require a two-thirds vote. Uh, since the uh, registered voter raised a question, I will uh, take, a t uh, let's, Take a standing vote. All those in favor of the motion rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. <laughs> All those opposed uh, rise and remain standing until counted by the monitors. Precinct 1. Precinct 1 reports 17 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 2. 18 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 3. I'm sorry, how many in favor? 22 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 4. Precinct 4, 15 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 5. Precinct 5, 29 in favor, none opposed. Precinct 6. Should have taken the voice vote. 20 in favor, zero opposed. Precinct 7. 22 in favor, zero opposed. And precinct 7. Precinct 8. Precinct 8. 13 in favor, zero opposed. At large. At large, 14 in favor, none opposed. It's unanimous. Uh, <laughs> What's the point? Yes. Motion made and second, we dissolve the warrant. All those in favor manifest by saying aye. Opposed, no. Thank you, town meeting members.